All right, welcome everyone uh, for our restart of our research seminar. And it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome Craig Costello today, who is a principal researcher at Microsoft in the, in the US. And uh, he works a lot on computational number theory and cryptography. And today he will present to us uh, one of our, his latest works on finding twin smooth integers for isogeny based cryptography. So Craig, the stage is yours. Thanks, Philip. And thanks, Sarah. And thanks everyone for um, inviting me and having me at the seminar. It's just good to be, um, good to have any reason to interact with people in, in these, uh, these funny times. So thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about this problem of finding um, finding twin smooth integers, which is um, it's a really funny problem. It's got applications to isogeny based cryptography, um, which isogeny based cryptography is like a field that kind of requires a lot of um, it's kind of got a, a decent hurdle to uh, like a, a, a pretty high barrier of entry as far as the technical jargon and the background you need to understand the field. Um, but fortunately for this talk, as long as you kind of take my word that that this problem is interesting in the context of isogeny based cryptography, we don't really need to understand anything about isogenies. Um, so I will touch on, I will touch briefly on why this problem is interesting in isogeny based cryptography, but otherwise, um, the only prerequisites we really need for the talk is um, understanding the difference between a prime and a composite number. So if you're doing cryptography and you should probably know the difference between a prime and a composite. Um, and if that's, if you know what that is, then that's basically all, all, all you need. So, um, so yeah, this, this is a problem that, um, it's kind of new in the context of cryptography. Um, I've been thinking about it for a, a little over a year now, um, pretty much full time and the the methods of finding twin smooth um the method of finding twin smooth integers that i'll talk about today is kind of like um a first attempt at, at trying to solve the problem uh in the interesting ranges um but i'm i'm almost certain that it's not the end of the road um it's kind of like yeah it's a first attempt it's it's okay but I'm really hoping to interest more people in the problem. Um, and maybe some of you will be interested in, in talking to me about it um, after this talk or going off on your own and, and trying to find better, better twin smooths than what I've found. Um, so this is, yeah, this is joint work with Michael Meyer and Michael Narry. Okay, so what are twin smooth integers? Um, where are we? Yeah, so we're, we're interested in numbers like these two, um, the two in black there, rather than the other ones that are in gray. And the reason we're, we're interested in those is because if we write the factorizations of all of these numbers, um, the two that are, that are highlighted there, um, they're what we call smooth. So um, we tend to classify a number as being smooth or not with respect to a bound. And all it means is whether the numbers contain prime factors larger than that bound or not. So in this case, both of those numbers highlighted are what we would call 47 smooth um, or yeah. So if we set our smoothness bound at 47 or 50, um, those two numbers there are smooth with respect to that bound, whereas all the other numbers aren't. Um, and in, in crypto, we, or in computational number theory in general, we know a lot about smooth numbers. Um, and we know a lot about their distributions. There's been tons and tons of number theory done for a long, long time about smooth numbers, but um, finding them next to each other, which is what this talk is about. So finding two consecutive integers that are both smooth is, surprisingly well there's there's some literature on it but there's surprisingly not a not a great deal of work done that's kind of satisfactory for our purposes so what we want to do is find numbers that are like these two that are next to each other um but numbers that are a fair bit bigger so you can think that 
I guess the smallest, um, the smallest size of these numbers that we'd be interested in is anywhere over 200 bits. So anywhere over two to the 200. Um, that's where these numbers become, um, they offer kind of secure uh, post-quantum crypto through isogenies. Um, yeah, so this in this example, actually, these are the two largest 47 smooth twins. Um, and what that means is that any two consecutive numbers larger than these two must have, one of them must have a prime factor bigger than 47. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's what we're looking for. That's the that's the essence of the talk. Um, oh, and I should have said straight off the bat, please interrupt me um, at any time and, and ask questions because I've been thinking about this problem for a while, but I'm um, sure that it's kind of, yeah, it's a really niche problem and I don't expect anyone else to have been thinking about it. So um, if anything comes up, that's even if it feels like a stupid question, please interrupt me and, and uh, yeah, yeah, just send a, raise your hand or um, unmute or whatever. Yeah, so, so I, I, have a, I have a question like right away. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I mean, maybe maybe you will answer this anyway throughout the talk, but why why are these twin smooth uh, integers so interesting for like post quantum crypto, like and especially like isogeny based crypto? What, like, what would be the advantage over like the approaches that we know up until now? Yeah, perfect. You're. Uh, it looks that's not a planted question, but my next slide is well, okay. it's the outline of the talk. Um, <laughs> Excellent. But, the first, the first thing I'm going to ask, the first thing I'm going to answer is why. So good question. Um, so the, yeah, that's the talk outline. Um, I'm sorry that I got off to a late start with with some Zoom uh, problems on this side, but I'm going to quickly talk about why. And as I said, to really understand why, you probably need to understand uh, what's going on in the context of isogeny based crypto. But um, I'll kind of sketch why, and you can take my word that it is an interesting problem, at least to me. Um, and then part two of the talk is I'll talk about twin smooths, and um, I was kind of looking at them on my own for a while. So I'll discuss my first attempts at just doing this, and then um, I roped in the two Germans that worked with me on that on our recent paper, and that's part three, which is a, a, a much better method than I came up with on my own. Um, so yeah, so why? Why are we interested in these? Well, um, there's two recent uh, schemes, uh, two recent isogeny-based crypto schemes that were both presented at AsiaCrypt last year. So one is in the context of key exchange, or you can think of it as key encapsulation or encryption, that's B-side. And the other one is called Ski-Sign. And uh, that's a digital signature scheme. Um, so of all of the, like compared to all of the NIST candidates, including um, SIDH or PSYC, um, B-side offers the smallest um, public keys in the context of key encapsulation and encryption, um, only by a little bit over SIDH and PSYC, but compared to all the other candidates, like code and lattice space stuff, um, it's the, the keys are a lot smaller. And then Ski Sign, this new signature scheme that was the one of the best papers at AsiaCrypt, that the, the signatures there are a lot smaller than the post the other post quantum candidates from lattices and um, uh, multivariate schemes. Um, I think the closest uh, compact signatures are maybe Falcon, which is like a thousand yeah a kilobyte um, keys and a kilobyte signatures or something around those those sizes. So the the reason that isogenies are attractive in the post quantum setting is that um, they offer more compact. Uh, schemes or more compact keys and signatures than the other schemes. So that's why we're interested in them. Um, but the problem with both of these schemes and indeed with basically with isogeny based crypto in general is that it's um, a lot slower than, than lattices and codes and basically all, so it's got this trade off. It's got more compact, um, it's got more compact keys, but everything's a fair bit slower, like orders of magnitude slower. Um, so that's kind of good because it means we can hopefully make it a lot faster. I don't think the other the other schemes are gonna make their keys or their signatures smaller, um, but it means that there's the potential there at least for isogenies to 
um, to become a lot faster and then you know maybe be the maybe be the preferred way to do to do these public key things in a post quantum uh, in the post quantum setting the um, but both of these schemes they as always require us uh, uh, to fix a large prime a large prime p um, and in both of them what we want is both p plus one and p minus one to be smooth um, so to contain no real large prime factors, or at least to have um, to have a large part of the factorization of p plus one and p minus one to just contain small factors. Um, and the reason we want them to be as smooth as possible is just based on performance. So essentially, and this is where I'm going to make you take my word for it without any more explanation, but um, the idea is that the smoother that p plus one and p minus one are, the faster that these schemes will be. And it's not like, it's not like, um, it's kind of one of these things where if you can make them, you know, if you can change the largest factor by, let's say a factor of four. So if your largest factor was two to the 20 and now it's two to the 18, um, you're gonna see a, a factor two speed up immediately. Um, and so like, yeah, being able to find, to, to improve the smoothness of P plus one and P minus one um, is, is going to directly see isogeny based crypto, or at least these two schemes get a lot faster. Um, yeah, so if, if the prime is 2M plus one, then P minus one is 2M and P plus one is 2M plus two. So the smoothness of those two numbers is the, is the smoothness of the M and M plus one. Um, and so in, in our paper and in this talk, um, what I'm going to do is just focus on the twin smooth problem. And that is finding, finding two numbers, M and M plus one, that are as smooth as possible and kind of leave the primeness um, for later because it turns out that finding smooth twins is a lot easier than, uh, is a lot harder than worrying about whether their sum is going to be prime. So um, as long as we can find enough smooth twins, then eventually um, one of them will have a prime sum. Um, turns out that when M and M plus one are, are very smooth, the chances of P being prime is a lot higher than usual. Um, but in general, yeah, it, we find a, a dozen of, or you know, a couple, maybe a hundred of these smooth twins that of an interesting size, and, and one of them will have a, a prime sum that we can use in crypto. So for the rest of the talk, you can ignore the primeness thing and, and just focus on the fact that we want to find M and M plus one that are both um, as smooth as possible. So the reason, the reason being, and I'm going to kind of sketch um, why we, or how B side works at least, which is the, the key exchange scheme that requires this smoothness property. Um, so this is like a, a pictorial depiction of, of the SIDH protocol. Um, it kind of means nothing just looking at this, but Alice and Bob do this, um, do these funny walks on a set of nodes in a graph. This is a, uh, a graph that's just a set of, um, a set of J invariants, but you don't have to know what that is for the purposes of this talk. And Alice and Bob take these funny walks, which is just taking steps between nodes um, that are defined in, in these graphs. This is a toy example that's um, using the prime 431. And the reason I've chosen this prime is because it basically follows the same shape as the primes we use for psych and SIDH in practice. And that is we, we tend to look for primes that are a power of two times a power of three minus one. And the reason being is that um, the, the inventors of SIDH, Jao and DeFeo, originally wanted, um, so Alice computes three isogenies and Bob computes two isogenies. Um, and what they wanted was these two and three isogenies to be to be rational over over the field that we're working with, and and the way that we the way that they guaranteed that was to make sure that p plus one was divisible by um, in this case two to the power of four and in and three to the power of three. So they wanted um, Al so in in SIDH what that means is Bob uh, Alice will compute a, a two to the power of four isogeny and Bob will compute a three to the power of three isogeny. Again, you don't have to know what that means, um, 
but it, as long as Alice is two to the four and Bob's three to the three divide P plus one, then everything goes through nicely. Um, and, and their isogenies are rational over the, over the field. Um, so that, that's been the construction that's been used in SIDH and psych. And, um, and that's kind of what is changed in B-side and, and ski sign. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what Alice's two isogeny graph looks like because two to the four divides, um, divides P plus one, she gets all of these ni nice edges between the nodes. And Bob has a bunch of rational edges in his three isogeny graph. Again, don't, don't be overwhelmed by these messy looking pictures. All that matters is that uh, P plus one was divisible by two to the, two to the A and three to the B. Um, but the, the point of B side is that um, you don't need to squeeze Alice's isogeny uh, degree and Bob's isogeny both into P plus one, which is what we're saying in that second bullet point there. Um, the, the idea is that Alice's degree can divide P plus one and Bob's degree can divide P minus one. And if we're willing to do that, then what that means is um, our primes don't need to be as big as they used to be. So uh, in uh, SIDH and psych, if we, if we need uh, our prime, if we need both two to the A and three to the B to divide P plus one, then P plus one or P is roughly, um, I should have said that two to the A and three to the B need to be roughly the same size. So A is a lot, uh, a lot bigger than B. Um, but two to the A and three to the B are roughly the same, the same size. And P was roughly the product of those two sizes. So it's roughly two to the A all squared or roughly three to the B all squared. Um, but if we let Alice work with factors dividing P plus one and Bob dividing factors P minus one, then we can get primes that are half the size, um, which is attractive for a bunch of reasons. It means that the field arithmetic is a lot faster. Um, the keys are more compact, but uh, yeah, so that so that's offers a lot more potential. But what unfortunately happens is that we can no longer expect that uh, Alice and Bob can have two to the power of A and three to the power of B like they had before, because um, their isogeny degrees need to be co-prime. Um, so I've written in the fourth bullet point there that uh, Alice computes M isogenies and Bob computes N isogenies. Um, and if we divide the factor of two away, at least from P minus one, um, then what we're looking for now is large values of M and N. So large primes where M and N, uh, that. Once you divide two away, then M and N are definitely co-prime. Um, but unfortunately, we can't have um, we can't have M is two to the A and N is three to the B because the largest prime that has this property is seventeen. Um, and so, what that means we have to do is we have to relax Alice and Bob having two power and three power isogenies, and now they just have isogenies that are um, products of many prime powers. But again, the efficiency of their isogenies is very much dependent on the largest prime factor in each of M and N. So that's that's why we're looking to to um, to find these twin smooth twin smooth integers. Okay, any questions there before we before we go on? Nope. Cool. Okay. So yeah, for the rest of the talk. Um, don't worry about the, don't worry about isogenies. Forget those messy graphs we just saw and um, take my word for it that it, it is indeed interesting, at least to people working on isogeny based crypto that finding two large numbers next to each other that are, vote, that are both very smooth um, will be, will be, uh, will give solid performance gains in the context of of isogeny based crypto. Okay, so here's 
here's the um, the kind of I guess more formal def definitions of what um, what twin smooths are. As I said, we say an integer is B smooth if it has no factors larger than B, um, no prime factors rather larger than B, and two consecutive integers we call them B smooth twins or twin smooth with respect to the smoothness bound B um, if both of them are B smooth or if if their product is B smooth, which is the same thing. Okay, so um, our goal in the context of isogenies was to find P where P, P plus or minus one is, is smooth. And as I said, we can, re, we can restate the problem as finding M and M plus one next to each other, but both being smooth. And then don't worry about that primeness thing. Um, that kind of almost comes for free. So ideally what we'd like to do is just start with a, a smoothness bound as small as possible. So maybe two or three, and then to find the largest two numbers that are, that are next to each other that are, that are twin smooth with respect to this bound. Um, and so as, I, as you saw previously, the largest three smooth twins were eight and nine. So you can't find any two numbers. What, what that's saying is that any two numbers bigger than eight and nine, like any, any two consecutive integers larger than eight and nine must, one of them must have a prime factor larger than, than three. Um, in that case, their sum is 17, which was the, the largest prime um, with, that was between two, three smooth numbers. Um, ideally, we'd just like to keep increasing this smoothness bound and then find the, the, you know, find the largest twins with respect to that smoothness bound. The problem with that is um, once you, every time you increase the smoothness bound and include one more prime factor, the effort it takes to go and find all of the twin smooths with respect to that bound increases by a factor of two. So um, I went ahead and found the largest 113 smooth twins. Um, and you can see them there. The, hut, the, they, the first of them is that, um, that, la, that M that's about 74 bits. Um, so that M and M plus one are, are both 113 smooth. Um, but to, the, the work it took to go and find all of the 113 smooth twins, um, it required solving two to the pi of B Pell equations. And Pell equations are kind of annoying and difficult to solve. It requires um, a fair bit of computational effort. Um, but two to the 30, solving two to the 30 of them took, took me some time. Um, and the, the M that resulted, the, the largest twins that resulted from that weren't big enough to, to use for crypto. So as I said, we want, we want M and M plus one to be bigger than two to the 200. Um, and so in the very first version of, um, of my paper on B side, after, after finding that M, I claimed that, um, I said, oh, don't worry in the coming months, I'll just keep using more computation and eventually I'll find the largest, you know, whatever, I'll, I'll increase the smoothness bound and I'll find the, the, the best, um, the best twins that are, that are bigger than 200 bits. Um, but very quickly, I realized that the size of M as I was increasing the smoothness bound wasn't growing as fast as I needed it to. And that this was going to require more effort than I wish it did. Um, so the moral of the story is that it's very unclear what, size bound we can expect to achieve. Um, so we're looking for M and M plus one to be, to be smooth. And the best we've found to date is, um, there's an example we'll see in, in the end of the talk, but it's uh, M and M plus one are two to the, two to the 15 smooth. Um, my gut feeling is it's gonna be a lot, lot better than that. We could, I, I kind of feel like even increasing the smoothness bound to two to the 10, we should be able to find numbers that are big enough. Um, but my intuition is that we just, we haven't found the best method of finding them. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in looking at this problem, I, yeah, I suggest you do because it's, um, I, I really feel like this, this work that we've done is kind of like just dipping our toes in the water and it's not, um, it's not going to, it's certainly not the best method of, of finding twin smooths for, for our sogeny based crypto. But yeah, the moral of the slide is that I don't know what the smoothness bound is going to be. 
Um, but we can't just hope. Uh, I should have said actually that once you fix a smoothness bound, there's a theorem due to Stormer from over a century ago that says there's only finitely many twins with respect to that smoothness bound. So if I said, find me the largest set of, uh, set of twins that are 200 smooth, though that largest, that largest, those largest twins exist. Um, it's just, I, I can't solve enough Pell equations to go and find them yet because the number of primes, um, the number of primes less than 200, well, maybe 200 was too small, but if, if it was the number of primes less than 500 is maybe a hundred odd and I don't want to solve two to the hundred Pell equations. So um, it's, it's unclear how to, how to um, solve this problem optimally. One thing that um, we need in talking about the um, talking about the methods we're going to look at is to understand smoothness probability. Um, this is something that's used in the factorization literature and discrete log literature and all through computational number theory. So it's a very well understood um, uh, probability, I guess. Um, but to me, it was really counterintuitive. So when I first started to look at this problem, um, the probability of a number being smooth, uh, yeah, it, it was a lot less than I thought it should be. Um, so for example, so we've got this function here, row of u, and I haven't written what row of u is because it's a, it's a, it's a function that they can't actually, we can't write down um, as a, like a closed formula function. Um, so all I've done is written the value of row of u, um, like all the computational algebra packages have the row function built in. So you can input any u value you want and you can, it'll give you what, the, the row value is, but essentially what you do is um, if you, so I guess in this case, it's best illustrated with an example. So suppose we have a random M that's 256 bits. So you take a random 256 bit number and what you want to say is what's the probability that none of its factors, none of its prime factors are larger than half its size, half its bit size. So like none of its prime factors are larger than two to the 128. Because 128 is half of 256, that's row of two. So row of two tells you the probability as these numbers tend to infinity, which for our purposes, we can kind of think that they are because they're cryptographically sized numbers. So they, I don't know, they are tending towards infinity, but row of two says the probability that a 256 bit number doesn't have any factors larger than 128 bits. So roughly a third of those numbers, or maybe just a little less than a third of 256-bit numbers don't have any factors bigger than two to the 128. Um, but then when you look further down and you say, okay, what about, what about the probability that a 256-bit number doesn't have any factors that are bigger than two to the 64? Then you, you can use row of four and you see that it's you know less than one in 200. So less than, if you keep just choosing 256-bit numbers, you're going to have to search through 200 of them until one of them is two to the 64 smooth. Um, and so these, when I first became familiar with this row function and, and the explicit values it spits out, it was counterintuitive, at least to me, that, that numbers don't factorize smoothly as much as you would hope that they do. Um, and so, if we're looking for the, the bottom bullet point there, if we're looking for a number that's two to the 16 smooth, what's the probability of that? Um, it's yeah, 10 to the negative 21. So it's like two to the negative 70. So if we're, if we're randomly just choosing 256 bit numbers, then we're gonna have to look through two to the 70 of them until we can hope that, they, that one of them factors into numbers that are no bigger than two to the 16. Now, obviously, if we're looking for one smooth number of 256 bits, um, hopefully all of us could construct one. We can just take two to the 256. So you can construct one smooth number very easily, which is what we do in SIDH. We take two to the I times three to the J plus one. Uh, well, no, two to the I times three to the J is, is smooth. And that's P plus one. Um, but the problem is that we need them right next to each other. And that's where this, this problem becomes, becomes difficult. 
Um, and so you could think of, uh, you could think, okay, so that, that kind of brings me to the, the naive methods. I'm, I'm calling them naive methods. Well, at least the first one's the naive method. Um, but these are the three methods in the, in the original paper um, that look to try to, to try to find, to find twin smooths. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on them, but um, it's the third one that's kind of paves the way for, for the rest of the talk. Um, but so the, the most naive method, I guess, would be to construct a smooth number of, of 250, size 256 bits. So take um, here in this, in this slide, the gr green is smooth and red is non-smooth or like something that we, that we, have, we hope to be smooth. Um, so the most naive way is to like, just keep constructing smooth numbers. So take powers of two or pay, take products of two and three and five or whatever you like, very small primes, and then just hope that one of its neighbors is also smooth. Um, but as we saw in the previous slide, the probability, if we, if we have M being smooth, the probability of that 256 bit M plus one being smooth is two to the negative 70. So it's like, just beyond reach or, or getting very close to what we could actually hope to do um, computationally. Uh, um, so I, I, have, I have one quick question just yeah. uh, as a clarification. Um, so is it correct that when we find these smooth numbers, then we can repurpose them like in a way like it, as we would like repurpose a, a generator for, for an elliptic curve or something like that for our crypto systems? Or do we need to generate these smooth numbers every time like two, two users come up and want to, to do such, some cryptographic Such a good question. Effort? Such a good question because, um, because it, yeah, I should, have, I should have said that at my very first slide because it sets the tone for the talk. Um, we only need to find one of these and then we're sorted. Okay. It's just, it's, it's, it'd be like, yeah, it's like setting um, the, the parameters for the crypto system for good. So if you just happen to stumble across a 256 bit M and M plus one that are, that are very smooth, um, again, so long as their sum is prime, which happens regularly, um, then we're done. We've, we've solved the problem. And, okay. yeah, and Alice and Bob, or like, uh, an isogeny based crypto system can be used for good. Um, and so, yeah, the, this is, we only need one of these, one of these twins that is smooth at any given security level. And uh, all of the, all of the crypto that takes place will happen over those using those same smooth values. Yes. Thank, thanks okay. for, for the cool. question. Yeah. Um, yeah. This, this doesn't, this doesn't need to be reconstructed once we've got it. We're, we're looking just for one. Yeah one instance so that we can parameterize a crypto system and then we're good. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. So this, the, the first kind of non-naive method um, uh, that I tried was um, rather than, rather than choosing all of M to be smooth and hoping that M plus one was, you can use um, the extended Euclidean algorithm to basically choose half of each of the numbers to be smooth. So um, if you input two co-prime numbers to the Euclidean algorithm, so if I input, let's say two to the, two to the A and three to the B, um, I'm abusing notation here because A and B, yeah. So if, if little a is two to the big A and little b is, two to, is three to the big B, then because those two numbers are co-prime, I'm guaranteed that I've got, that there's an S and T that exist such that A times S plus B times T is one. That's like, um, that's just by definition of them having no common divisor. Um, and there, then I can take the absolute value of AS and BT and I'm guaranteed that um, A times S and B times T are one apart. So in this case, what I'm hoping for is that the output of the Euclidean algorithm gives S and T that are, that are smooth. Um, but again, these numbers tend to be uh, numbers where we can't control what their factors are. So instead of, the, in the first method, instead of hoping that that 256-bit number is smooth, the second method's kind of hoping that two 128-bit numbers are smooth. 
um, it's a lot higher probability because um, the probability that a 128 bit number is in this case, two to the 16 smooth is a lot better. It's like two to the negative 25 chance. So the probability that both S and T are two to the 16 smooth is like two to the negative 50. Um, but again, it kind of, it kind of paves the way for what with the thought process behind it, uh, these better methods, which is you want to, you want to try to guarantee that, um, in this case, we've guaranteed that M and M plus one are at least split down the middle. So they at least factor into two chunks each. Um, and that, that helps a lot because then you're not, you're not looking for 256 bit numbers to be smooth anymore. You're looking for 128 bit numbers to be smooth, which is a, a much bigger probability. Um, but again, this method and for any given A and B, this method, um, this method did, uh, you, you can, you can produce many S and T that are, um, that are the right size, but the hopes that they're, um, that the hopes that they're smooth is kind of low. And then the third method in the original paper um, was, was, I've called it the power method here, but essentially um, I should have, I've written M and M minus one there. I should have written M and M plus one, but essentially it's, it's letting M plus one be X to the six and M be X to the six minus one or X to the N and X to the N minus one where N is a, N is a small integer. And the reason being is that you get these factorizations. Um, so in, the, in this case, if uh, X is smooth, then of course X to the six is smooth. Um, and so as long as, as long as X is smooth, then N plus one will be smooth. Um, and now we're not looking for a 256 bit number to be smooth, but rather like a 42 or 43 bit number to be smooth. Um, and then, and then on, the, on the right hand side with, with M, you're looking for the product of X plus one, X minus one, and these two quadratics to be smooth. And X plus one and X minus one are both, again, roughly 42 or 43 bits. And the other ones are roughly, you know, 80, 84, 86 bits. Um, and those, probability, those smoothness probabilities are a lot higher. Um, and so that's kind of the method that was most successful in the original paper. Um, oh, okay. I've gone through the, each of the methods here, um, but we've kind of already done that on the previous slide. So I'm gonna skip past these quickly in the, um, these slides will of course be online. So if, you, if you're interested in those other methods, the GCD method or the, the power method, then, um, consult the slides later. Um, but I've also given some examples of, of real, real examples that were found using that power method in the original paper. So when it turned out that, that N equals six, so the six power was a, kind of a sweet spot for this method. The higher the power, the often the better the factorizations look, but the higher the power means the less X you've got to search through. So if you might want to choose X to the 12 um, and X to the 12 minus one, because the factorizations there are nice, um, but then you've only got roughly two to the 20 numbers to search through to hope um, of finding smoothness and primality and, and so on. So it's like the bigger, the bigger N, the better, the better probability of, of smoothness, but the less numbers you've got to search through. So N equals four and N equals six was the sweet spot with that example. Um, Okay, the the with the PTEC is is what's kind of new in this is in this more recent paper, um, and the way to think about it is to to think about that that third method, um, which was you know m plus one is x to the six and and m was x to the six minus one. The problem with that method was the high degree terms. So the two quadratic terms that appear in um, the factorization of X to the six minus one, they turn out to be the problem because um, again, the bigger the number, the, the less chance that it's going to be smooth. Um, so I've said there that the probability of X or X minus one or X plus one being B smooth is far greater than that of the quadratics being B smooth. Um, and using that using I've, I've used the smoothness bound two to the 14 there to get 
um, and, and suppose that, that our input X is roughly two to the 42, um, because then X to the six is close to 256 bits. Um, and a smoothest bound of two to the 14, just so that the, the row value is written down nicely, the input to the row function. But the probability that a 42 bit number is two to the 14 smooth is roughly uh, 0 0.04. So roughly, you know, 4%. But the probability that one of those quadratic terms ends up being smooth is one in 10,000 or one in 100,000, one in 10,000. Um, so it's much, much more likely that those linear terms end up being smooth and even row, row of three squared, which you can think of as being the probability that two linear terms are both smooth, um, is a lot higher than the probability that a quadratic term is smooth. I'm bearing a lot of implicit assumptions here, which is that, um, uh, that the smoothness is kind of uniformly distributed amongst these polynomials, which is um, it's a strong assumption, but it turns out to hold for all of the stuff that, that we, uh, for all of our purposes, it's, it's, a, it's a good approximation to, to still use this row function. Um, so what, what the idea behind this work is, is can we find M and M plus one, can we find polynomial functions where F of X and G of X split completely into linear terms? So can you find two polynomials that split completely into linear, factor, linear factors that only differ by one. Um, and initially when we first, so one example is X squared and X squared minus one, which is kind of falls into the category of the above method, but that's only degree two. What we'd like is as high degree as possible. Um, and it, because that helps our smoothness probability, but we're looking for these two polynomials F and G that, that you can write as, as product of linear polynomials. Uh, yeah, linear terms. Um, and so here's an example of a degree four of a degree four polynomial. So f of x is x minus one through to x minus 10, the product of those. G of x is x through to x minus 11, the product of those. Those two functions, if you, if you expand them, you can see that they just differ by a constant. So they just differ by the constant 180. So if I divide each of those functions by 180, and in turn, I'm, I'm casting them into, um, into the uh, polynomials with rational coefficients, which is fine. Then as long as the X that I input is, um, gives F of X congruent to G of X is zero mod one 180, then evaluating those polynomials that that X will, um, will give rise to two integers that differ by one. Okay, so that's the whole idea. We're looking, we're essentially looking for f of x and g of x that split completely into linear terms that differ by a constant so that we can divide both by both of those uh, polynomials by that constant. Um, and so that's the kind of polynomials we're looking for. And the, and the three of us, this is, this is the, um, the work that I did with the two Michaels and the three of us started trying to construct these polynomials and we ran into a lot of problems trying to do it constructively beyond degree four. So we could, we could kind of come up with parameterized versions of these polynomials for degree four, but beyond degree four, we were running into a lot of problems trying to do it ourselves. Um, so that's when we decided to actually look at the literature and see if any mathematicians had done this um, done this before and that's where um, that's where we found that this is indeed connected to a, a, a kind of long-standing problem in in uh, computational number theory or number theory um, but you, you get the idea now so rather than rather than searching for m such that m plus one is smooth we're now searching for x such that those eight factors or such that the other seven factors are smooth um, which again the probability is a lot better once, once these numbers are, um, you know, one quarter the size. So it turns out that searching for these polynomials that just differ by a constant, but split, it's connected to a problem called the prouhe tarry ascot problem. Um, and that is a problem that asks to find um, two disjoint multisets, uh, a1 through an and b1 through bn. So two, two 
disjoint multisets where the sum of their sum is the same, the sum of their squares is the same, the sum of their cubes is the same and so on up to n minus one. So up to n minus one, it turns out that that's as much as you can hope for. And if all of those sums of powers are the same, um, then you've got a solution to the, to the PTE problem. And this can immediately be cast as those two, uh, as into two polynomials that we saw before. So the example I've given here, the set 0, 4, 7, 11, and the set 1, 2, 9, 10, their sum is the same, the sum of their squares is the same, and their sum of the cubes is the same. Um, and because, because of this, I guess I'll leave it as, as an exercise for the reader, um, but you can then write those two polynomials that we saw on the previous, on the previous uh, screen. Um, if, you, if you just take the, the product of X minus each of the numbers in each set, then um, they differ by a constant, those two polynomials. So, and this is, and this is, these two problems are equivalent. So if you've got a split polynomial, if you've got these two split polynomials that differ by a constant, then inherently you've got a solution to the PTE, PTE problem and vice versa. Um, so the good news was that rather than us having to like naively try and compute these, we could just dig around the, the literature and see what, um, what mathematicians had done in the past. It turns out that um, there's a lot going on in this slide, I apologize, but it turns out that there's known solutions to this problem um, up to degree 12. So if you look at that, that table that in the top right of the slide, um, there's known solutions to the problem for n equals 5, 6, all the way through 12. Turns out there's no solutions known for n equals 11. And there's no solutions known for n equals, for n beyond 12 to this problem. So n equals 12, to have a solution to that seems um, really hard because you're looking, for you're looking for two sets of 12 numbers that are disjoint where the sum is the same, the squares all the way up to their 11th power is the same. So that's kind of, you get the feeling that that's not easy to find. But um, fortunately, there was a lot of degree six solutions were known to the problem. And there's also methods known where you can turn a solution into an equivalent solution um, for some notion of equivalence where, um, where we were able to generate a lot of solutions. Um, uh, given, given one initial solution, we were able to generate a lot of solutions that, that are equivalent mathematically if to, in, with some notion of equivalence, but for the purposes of searching for a twin smooths were not equivalent. So n equals six turned out to be a sweet spot um, and in that table, there's, we've, we've put an upper bound on the constant so that that constant, these two polynomials differ by the previous example, the constant was 180. Um, the bigger, the constant, the, I guess in some way, the harder it is to search with the polynomials. So we, we were, uh, putting upper bounds on the, the bit length of these constants for a reason that you can look at in the paper. Um, but for n equals six, if we bounded the constant at two to the 50, we've got over 2000 solutions to go searching with. Um, so all of these, we've, I've just taken a snapshot from our code there. All of these solutions give rise to two, two polynomials that differ by a constant. Um, and now what we can do is turn this into a seeding algorithm that, um, that seeds all of these solutions at the same time. So we're not just looking for X such that that first F and G turn out to be smooth. We're looking for X such that any of the F and G's corresponding to those 2000 solutions was smooth, um, which turns out to be a lot, a lot faster and a lot better in practice. Um, so the probability of that first polynomial that the F and G in the first example is smooth was two to the negative 41. But the second one, you've got some repeated factors there, which helps the probability. So there's only nine linear terms in that second one, which means that the probability that um, those two are smooth, the, the f of x is a square, which means the probability that those two are smooth is a lot better. Okay, for the interest of time, it's gonna, the rest of the talk's gonna go quite quickly, um, but we're going to just look at how we identify smooth numbers in an interval. So I've chosen a smoothness bound as seven to keep it kind of short. 
But the way we see for smooth numbers in, in an interval is like an old, um, it's called the sieve of Eratosthenes. It's like a um, ancient Greek way of looking for prime numbers, but you can repurpose it to look for smooth numbers as well. So the way we do it is I've just chosen an interval here. It's kind of a well-chosen interval um, of 50 numbers. We take the, we take the, the prime two and we look for all the multiples of two. So underneath, sorry, underneath each of these great, each of these numbers, I've, I've started with a one. So you start with a one in all of these positions and you look at all the multiples of two and you just multiply that, um, that number, multiply the one by two. And then you look at all the multiples of four and you multiply the number underneath all those by two again. And you look for the multiples of eight and you, Again, multiply the number, the running number underneath each of those indexes by eight. And you keep doing that with all the multiples of two until you've exhausted. And there's no more, in this case, there's no multiples of 512 in that, in that interval. So then you're done with two. You do the same thing with three and nine and 27 and three to the four, 81. Three to the five, it turns out that that number in the middle, because I kind of cherry picked this interval. Um, so that turns out that that number there, 4734 is divisible by three to the seven. Um, I'm going to go quickly through five here, five squared. There's two numbers in there that are divisible by 25, only one by five cubed, which was also divisible by five to the four. No multiples of five to the five, so we're done with the prime five. Then we look for the multiples of seven, the multiples of seven squared and there's no multiples of seven cubed there. Then what we do is look over that interval once we've, so we're finished with two, three, five, and seven. Then we look through that interval and say, are any of the numbers there, are any of the numbers below equal to the, equal to the index of the, that, that, they're, that they're underneath? So it turns out that both those numbers, um, both of the, the running values underneath those numbers um, is equivalent to the index. So those numbers must be seven smooth. Um, and that's basically the gist of how we, how we search for smooth numbers in an interval. Um, there's, and so essentially what we do is we input an interval that's as large as we like, and we input out all of our primes up to the smoothness bound, and we process that interval. And at the end of the day, we end up with a bit string. And the bit string basically says, yes, it's smooth or no, it's not. And the way we use that bit string with our PTE solution, I, I realize we've, I've only got probably two or three more minutes. I'll, I'll hurry to the end here, sorry to, to run over. Um, so we end up with a bit string and then we can process that bit string according to the, to the uh, solutions to our PTE problem. There's a bunch of optimizations to, the, to that sieving in an interval that I won't go into, but essentially you don't need to do multiplications of primes. You can, you can use logarithms instead and, and do additions. Um, and there's a bunch of approximations to this sieve that, that make it run a lot faster in practice, but all of that's in this book by Crandell and Pomerance. So how does our uh, PTE sieve work? Phase one is to, phase one is kind of independent of the PTE solution. It's basically you input a, an interval. The interval can be as large as you want, depending on the memory of your machine. So we chose intervals of two to the 20, two to the 30, two to the 40, depending on our, our memory. Um, and you take all of the primes up to your smoothness bound and do exactly what I just did. And you turn that interval of, of indexes into a bit string. And then you just check that bit string against your uh, PTE solutions. So this is an example that was done with our um, smoothness bound of two to the 15. We're looking for X values. There's again, 50 values here. Um, so we sieved with all of the primes up to two to the 15, turn those intervals into a bit string. Turns out that those were the, um, those are the numbers in that interval that are two to the 15 smooth. And then what we can do with a given, with a given PTE solution. So in this case, the PTE solution is 0, 3, 5, 11, 13, 16, and 1, 1, 8, 8, 15, 15. So there's basically nine nine numbers there that um, nine values that we need to align with ones. Okay, so I've, I've looked at those nine values in the PTE solution. They correspond to 
um, nine indices that we essentially just keep shifting along looking for all ones. And eventually when we find all ones, um, we know that X, in this case, X being that la being the number that corresponds to that one on the far right is smooth. X minus one is smooth. X minus three is smooth. X minus five is smooth and so on. So all of the numbers in that PTE solution um, are smooth, which means the two, evaluating the two polynomials will guarantee two smooth numbers. In that case, U was this number here. And so there we have it. So F and G are the two polynomials written there. U was the number we found there. Um, and in this instance, um, indeed the sum of those two numbers, the two numbers that they found when evaluating those polynomials was, was prime. So the prime is the green number written at the bottom. P plus one is the factorization of, of F, I think. And P minus one is the factorization of G, which um, is our record. So two to the 15, I think that number's two, uh, I think 250 bits or 241 bits, I think. Um, but that's the best number we've been able to come up with to date. Two to the 15 smooth. Okay. One slide for future work, which is, it's to me, it's really, really open. Um, this PTE solution sieve is like the best thing we could think of so far. Um, but as I said, if you're interested in looking at this problem, I, I recommend you do because this is still a very much a first go. And even as, as recently as the last couple of days, we've had new thoughts that they could turn out to be crap, but they could turn out to be a lot better. And um, we're not sure. So I, I encourage you to, to get interested in the problem if, if you like. Um, but yeah, the, the, the paper with the PTE is on the archive, it's going to be at Eurocrypt um, in, a, in a couple of months. And yeah, don't know if we've got time for questions, but I'm happy to take them offline or now or whenever. Okay, yeah. Thanks a lot, Craig, for, for that uh, great talk. I think it was very, very interesting. Uh, let me quickly stop the recording and then we we'll, can take maybe one or two more questions.